You're listening to the Spark Radio Network, Internet radio like you've never heard before. Innovation, creativity, and imagination are all said to begin with a spark. So fasten your seatbelt and take the ride of your life and listen for the spark. The leader in talk radio on the Internet, right here on K98talk.com. My name is Jessie. I'm a United States Special Forces widow. This gives me a unique perspective on the world around us. If you're willing to listen, I'll tell you how I see it, and I won't for any countries. This is my POV, which stands for Point of View. All right, thank you guys for listening. Yes, I know my podcast changed subject. By the way, I'm ADD, so I've got a whole new subject and topic today and a guest. I've got my friend who some of you heard me mention in America Off the Rails, Judy L. Moore from New Zealand. She is an editor, but she's so much more than that. So, Judy, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, thank you for having me first. Um, A little bit about myself. I always hate those questions, and they're really loaded questions. Um, As you said, I am an editor. I'm also a writer of myself. I have a background in astronomy and engineering, where I specialized in astronomical instrumentation. I am a mother of two teenagers. Astronomical instrumentation. Wow. I can't even wrap my brain around that. (laughs) Yeah, I spent far too long down at Mount John University Observatory, which is in Kekapo, New Zealand, every month going down and playing with the telescope. It was so much fun. It's just so much fun doing that. Um, I'm also a mother of two teenagers, so I do the wonderful mom's taxi routine. I used to be a scout leader, and my husband and I do a lot of tramping and hiking through New Zealand bush. So we have lots of varied activities, and we have lots of fun. All right. Now, the context I brought you up in, in case for anyone who doesn't remember, I was redoing the sparkradionetwork.com website and I was I was going crazy trying to get the whole thing done in as fast as possible which ended up being about two days yeah it was about two or three days that was for sure and (laughs) the person I leaned on for moral support and the occasional "Ah, I don't know how to word this was Judy Yes, and I'm still wondering exactly how that happened, but that's okay. (laughs) Because you're my friend, and you care? Yeah, I do. (laughs) So why But there was so much fun. Um, There were a few things that came through, and it was just, you have to get these wording just right, just to be snazzy and just grab attention, and it, it takes a different skill to do that while i do some writing mine isn't always designed to get your attention sometimes it's you know i write a report for work or i write a blog post which i want to get your attention but not in the same way as i want one or two catchy sentences for a website now judy you recently as in within the past what three or four months started your own editorial business Black Wolf Editorial. Yes. Why don't you give us your website address and tell us what made you decide to start, become, you know, to become a professional editor and start a business? Sure. Uh, Black Wolf Editorial Services. Uh, you can find us at www.blackwolfeditorial.com. And basically what it was is I, on a regular basis, was being asked to critique various different writers' manuscripts, but I wasn't getting anything out of it for myself. And on a regular basis, I would get yet another email going, can you please critique this? And can you please critique this? And in the end, I'm like, well, I'm doing this. Why am I doing this for free? (laughs) I should be being paid to do this. 
and it just turned out to be a perfect compliment because I'm a full time writer at home. I, I no longer work in research as I used to. And it just meant that it was a methodology that I can bring in money, but do something I love. I actually love reading people's stories and having my mind go off into far off worlds. It's just so much fun. Okay, you've mentioned so your own it. writing. Um, other than writing, are are you involved with the writing community at large? Are you do you have an online presence? What do you do locally? Yeah, um, I live in New Zealand, uh, Christchurch, New Zealand, and I'm the president of the Christchurch Writers Guild. I'm also the municipal leader for NaNoWriMo. For those that don't know what NaNoWriMo is, or NaNoWriMo, as I keep getting corrected, is basically in every year in November, you dedicate yourself to writing a novel from start to finish, within the span of 30 days. A novel. Now, it sounds like a daunting, yes, a whole novel. Wait a minute. Now, Novels are like, like daunting. hundreds of thousands of words, or they seem to be. They seem to be, but NaNoWriMo in particular, it targets 50,000 words. Now, that may sound like a lot, but if you sit down and you break it into small little sections, it's only 17,000 17, words a day it's not a lot 17,000 or 1700 sorry <laughs> 1700 oh well, 17... I'm no good at math but 17,000 was like you'd be done in a couple of days and I, that didn't seem like a project for a month that sounds like 17,000 a day <laughs> I can't think of that many words I'm not sure I say that many although as talkative as I am you never know but I have to admit I do <laughs> And how many of those are yelling at teenagers? <laughs> Probably a bit too many, but that's okay. We'll just, let's, let's just move on. <laughs> All right. So uh, what genre do you... Okay, so it's 1,700 words. So the min- so you've got NaNoWriMo, Municipal Leaders. I'm also actively involved in Spec Fix New Zealand, which is for speculative fiction. And I take part in an online community called Scribophile. I'm also on Twitter. I'm on Facebook. I'm everywhere. I also have two blogs that I actively participate. They're they're actually mine. One is the editorial blog that's on blackwolfeditorial.com. And the other one is my own personal blogs, which ranges on subjects, things like how I want to occasionally kill my kids, but I'm not allowed to. Um, I also write about various different things of my path and my journey, and that's on my personal blog judyelmore.com. You sound like you are a very busy woman. So you mentioned your writing. Yes. Uh, what genre do you write and do you have a favorite one to read? My favorite genre, full stop, is fantasy and science fiction. I love my mind to be taken away from this world and into other worlds. That's the way I am. That's the way I like to work. So I write in that genre and then I read mostly for casual reading in that genre. I love action. If it's filled with action, I am so there. I actually like the big fight scenes. There's something about the excitement of a fight scene that just goes, oh, get me going, get me going. Um, So I, I write those and I love reading those as well. Which also probably means I probably should read a few more thrillers than I do, but I'm slowly being convinced. Okay, so do you have a favorite author? My favorite author is actually Terry Goodkind. Terry Goodkind has written the Sword of Truth series. There was a television series that came out many years ago called The Legend of the Seeker. And it was two seasons of that that had shown. And that was based on the the first two books of the Sword of Truth series. There's actually 15 books in that series now. Wow. Sounds about right. And I'm still reading the last three. All right. So we've talked a little bit about writing, a little bit about reading. What do you think makes your editorial business different from every other editorial business out there? Do you... What... What do you think makes yours special? 
like all editors, I offer the standard things of critiquing and developmental online editing, as well as what we call copy editing. But one of the things that I have very deliberately chosen to do is I don't limit that to being just novels. A lot of writers out there have been told to start with short stories. And sometimes that's the way their brain works, that they work on that short snippet of life. But why should somebody who writes a short story be prohibited from using a professional editor on their beloved story just because it's not of the novel length? So I will do short stories and I actually have rates designed for that. And I also take a look at the whole gambit. A lot of writers nowadays are what we call self-published. And with that, they need to actually have the full thing about a book blurb. They need to have their own writer's bio and a whole bunch of other bits and pieces. And those are not easy things to write. So I have services that will help workshop those as well. And I think that's where it puts me different and puts me unique. I will admit I was checking out your website and just for comparison, I looked through a number of other editors' websites. I didn't see very many, if any, that would take anything under 10 to 20,000 words. And I didn't see anybody offering a bio service. Now, yeah. this blog post, well, you, you mentioned something to me off there that I'm going to bring up and I promise you this blog post will not go up until the 23rd of April. You yeah. have a special. It's actually going to go. Through, it's going to go live on the twenty third of May, not the twenty third of April. Okay. But this special, it's it's in conjunction with a workshop that I'm running, or part of here in Christchurch, New Zealand, on marketing. And the special is going to be basically the website health check. So the special will include workshopping of a bio for the author, as well as a review of a website, a Twitter, and the Facebook page. Okay, Those wait a minute. Three wait a minute. Main things. Wait a minute. Yeah. So you're going to have to dig into my website and fix it? Are you a website designer or? No, no, no. Basically, your website or your main portal is something that somebody comes and looks at and if they see a broken link, they suddenly get turned off. Or if it takes too long to find any information on your site because it's so cluttered, again, they will get turned off. Or if they are really interested in the information that you are providing on your blog, but they can't find or easily get to older posts that they are interested in, they get really flustered. I am not a web designer, but like everybody else, I do know how to navigate the web and what works well with a website. I will go through and take a look at what the content have you got and take and make comments about whether there actually is any grammatical issues or things that you may want to address, but I won't look at the actual content of the website's blog. So, for example, say you're a political writer, I won't comment on the appropriateness of your material because that is audience driven and that is hopefully something that they have done their research on. So are you going to proofread every blog or just look at the punctuation and the grammar on the main pages? I will just look at the punctuation and grammar on the main pages and in terms of the blogs, if I find it interesting, I might just carry on reading and you might get yourself a new follower because I find it just interesting and fascinating. But I will go through and comment about things like the writing style, how inviting it is and how, how standoffish it might be because with a blog, you do want to try to actually engage and sort of incite some sort of reaction from your readers, hopefully a positive reaction, not a negative one, but you never know. So you're going to look at basically how the website, the Twitter feed, and if they have one, a Facebook page or Amazon or Goodreads profile, how everything flows together, or are you just going to do Twitter, Facebook, and web? Ideally, I'd like to focus just on the Twitter, Facebook, and the web, mainly because these are the three that most people will have if they have an online presence. 
I myself do not have Instagram, so I don't have access into those systems. And I don't have Pinterest either. So those are the other two platforms that people frequently use, but I, I don't. So what I'm if, what if someone brain. who's not a writer uh, hears about your special either through this blog post or they trip over it somehow, word of mouth, I mean, you never know what people pick up on Twitter, and they say, I'm not a writer, but would you do my bi- look at my bio too? Sure. It's not a problem. The bio is one of those things. It's about your, the face that you want people to see, the, the persona that you want to portray to the public. It doesn't matter whether you're a writer or not. They all have a certain formula to them. Understanding how people react to certain statements does help to make that bio really strong and inviting. So yes, I would look at other all right, I'm going. We're going to take a quick commercial break here, and I will bring Judy back right after the upcoming advertisement. Got to play those advertisements. If you want to work until you keel over, have less of everything in retirement, or give back more of your hard-earned money to the stock market again, then just ignore me. But if you'd like to protect the money you save, receive a steady, predictable retirement income, and enjoy financial security for as long as you live, then listen to this. You can download a free report that reveals the wealth-building secrets Wall Street and the banks don't want you to know. You'll learn how you can get guaranteed growth, safety, and real prosperity without risking your money in the Wall Street casino and how to get the money you need when you need it simply by asking for it. This is the best way to have a 100% secure retirement and know your money will last as long as you do. To learn more about this method and to get your free report, go to 29security.com. That's the number 29security.com. 29security.com. Go to 29security.com. All right, folks, this is Rick Robinson with you. I want to tell you about some friends of mine from a company called Security Enforcement Specialist. When I ran my security agency for 12 years, I worked with one of these partners on a daily basis. He's been involved in this agency now, and with his other partner, they do have over 30 years of experience in the private security industry. If you own a business and you need someone to keep you or your customers or residents safe, then I highly recommend contacting Security Enforcement Specialist today. Give them a call at 405-703-1796. Again, that's 405-703-1796. Again, tell them Rick from K98 Talk sent you. Like I said, if you need the help, they are here for you, so make sure that you uh, go look them up, check them out, and see what they can do. The wrong way! Welcome to the All right, uh, we are back. I'm my my guest Judy Elmore from New, Christchurch, New Zealand, is still with us, and let's get back to the topic of editing, which is a subject near and dear to her her heart. Judy, you mentioned you do editing. What are the yes. most common mistakes you see day in day out in every manuscript? In every manuscript, I can guarantee would be a bit of a exaggeration but in a large number of manuscripts there are a few things that I see especially from new writers of fiction one of the things is too much backstory basically what that means is that you have this idea of the world and the background of your characters or of your worlds itself and you will put everything out there thinking that it's important for your reader to know but it's not. I mean, the best example I can give of that is think of the iceberg itself, Titanic. The Titanic, as it was floating around on the water, it saw the iceberg, it saw it above the water. But at the end of the day, you don't care what that iceberg looks like underneath the water. All you care about is the fact that it ripped open the whole of the ship. And it's the same with the reader. We don't care those little details that are underneath the water. We just care about the effects that have happened. And that's, that's what basically I, one of the things I see. I also see quite frequently the he said, she said problem with dialogue. This one is a little bit of a 
a nitpicky thing for me. It drives me a bit cuckoo. Ah, so when that's you have your pet peeve. A, it's one of my. It's just one of my pet peeves. Yeah, it's you'll have a, a a bit of dialogue that bounces between two characters, and after every line, you have a he said, she cried, he whispered, she mooed, she crooned. Like, no, 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 no! Don't do that. Um, it's better to go through and say things like. He picked up his coffee and took a sip. It was hot. It was hot enough to burn his lip and then have his dialogue and then carry on with the other character going, he didn't need to drink it so fast. He does the same, drinks her coffee and burns her lip too. Yeah, those sorts of things that you don't need to have that he said, she said. I also see what we call a head bob. Now this one, I think anybody who's read fiction or is really into fiction will know what I'm talking about when I say a point of view character. You have a certain character that that story is being told from. So you're inside that character's head. You can see everything they see. You understand what they're thinking and their thought processes about what's going on. And then occasionally you have a single line about what some other character thought Unless your point of view character is a mind reader, they're not going to know what the other character is thinking. And that's what we call a head bop. You okay. can get away with it if your mind character, if your character is a mind reader, though. <laughs> so in your genre, it's possible if, if your character has special magical abilities to read other people's thoughts. Exactly. And in fact, in, in my first novel, I've actually got exactly that. She, she deliberately goes through and, and probes everybody's minds. And so she's hearing all of these thoughts. But again, it, you can't do it all the time. It has to be very specific and you have to make it very clear that that is what's going on or you will confuse your reader. Okay, so that, that needs special editorial handling? Oh, yes, definitely. All right. Now, what editing... Okay, the most common thing I hear when I mention editing is, isn't that just grammar, punctuation, and commas? I knew you were going to say that. Oh, I knew that. As soon as you started saying that, I knew exactly what you were going to say. So I hear exactly the same thing all the time. No. Yes, there is editing that will look at punctuation, grammar, commas, those sorts of things. That is actually known as copy editing. So if you're looking at editorial services and that is exactly what you want is somebody just to look at the grammar, the punctuation and your spelling, then you're going to be looking for what we call a copy editor. But if you're actually looking into more about your story. So you want to know about the flow of how a story works, whether a character is actually coming to life in a reader's mind, whether the scene itself is coming to life in the reader's mind, whether the whole story makes sense, whether you have characters that have been introduced, so they're not just suddenly talking heads, or whether you have consistency, you've set up a scene and the table in the room hasn't suddenly moved to the other side of the room. Those sorts of things are what we call developmental or line editing. So they take a little bit more effort, a little bit more time, but that's really what an editor like myself loves to do because that's when we can see the stories and we can help the stories grow and become this amazing beast that just leaps off the paper. Okay, so when people are turning over their manuscripts to you, I know because I do some writing and I have used your services because as my listeners ought to know by now, Jesse is a pseudonym. I write under my real name, which no offense, you is need to know and my listeners don't. That manuscript is like a child. Do people yes. do you ever have problems with people getting really defensive when you you get a, get this manuscript and it's just oh no, half, two thirds of this manuscript is just not working. Everything is, there. there's so many mistakes, I can't even get into it. And how do you handle that kind of client? 
there's a couple of things and and yes i have come across a few things like that basically it is my job as the editor to actually help guide the writer to see the problems themselves because writing writing a story is actually easy shaping it into something that is worth reading that's the hard part and my editorial style really is more of a mentoring style so i will go through and and point out where things are not quite working but i will also give possible ways of how to change it to make it work better and i will actually point out where the flaws have gone and so hopefully the writer can actually see for themselves where it's gone and then they can start seeing the mistakes before I see it, before it comes to me. Yes, I have come across the odd one that was like, my writing is the best writing ever and you don't know what you're talking about and I'm gonna completely ignore anything and everything that you say. At which point I'm just going, that's okay. That is your opinion. You move right along. And at what, that point I have really no choice but to go through and say, I'm sorry, I can't help you any further because you're not open to what I'm trying to say. For those that are open, hey, I'm willing to help you. Okay, you mentioned that uh, he said, she said are one of your pet peeves. What are some of the other, your, what's one of your other ones? I think there was something you, we men, you mentioned off air about rushing the process. Oh, yeah, rushing the process. Basically, Editing takes time. Anyone who's ever written a book will know that writing the book itself takes time, but editing easily takes at least twice the length of time that it took to write that book, if not more so. To give you an idea, my own novel, I started my first novel in 2008, and it's only just now at a point where I'm happy for it to be published. So we're talking an eight year journey. Granted, it has gone through so many different stages at that point and it has grown and it has become this big epic thing. But you don't need to take the eight year journey, obviously. You just don't rush the process. Anybody who thinks that they can write a novel in one month and then have it published the following month is really deluding themselves. If you think you can write a novel in one month, then you might be able to get it edited into a reasonable standard, assuming you're willing to put in the time and effort, probably within a six month to a year time frame. Okay, so those NaNoWriMo people, they need, they're not, when they finish their 50,000 words in November, their novels are basically a first draft or rough draft stage. They're a first draft, and in some cases, they're not even complete. I know a few people within the last November um, cycle within Christchurch have actually recently gone through and said, I finally finished my draft. And, and that's the thing. The 50,000 words is just a target. It's not necessarily means that you have your full story and your full arc. It takes a bit of effort and time to get those novels to the point where you feel happy. And at the end of the day, that is what it's about. Whether you as a writer feel happy with what you're producing and that word that you've put out. Because your name's the one that's attached to it. So you need to make sure that you are the one that's happy. Not anyone else. Okay, so what, what techniques do you use when you're editing? When I'm editing obviously i will read it through once i believe it or not i actually find reading a book on my kindle easier than reading it on my computer screen or on my tablet and i'm, I'm thinking it's because of the lighting there's something about using that different medium that helps you read it and helps you see it i will print out and i will put the nice lovely red pen through things when I can as well. But one of the biggest things that I do do is I read it aloud. So 
sometimes the eyes don't see things. Our, it's the way our brains work. Our, our eyes will happily fill in or correct any mistakes that we see and our brains just don't register them. But when we try to speak it, when we read it out loud, we hear it. So our eyes don't see it, but our ears pick it up. And it might be something simple as we've missed a the or the word to or in or at. It might be something really stupid like that. But those little things make the difference. All right. So I finished my 50,000 word NaNoWriMo and it's now February. So now, now this epic masterpiece is up to 75,000 words. Haven't looked at it myself. Is now the time for me to hire an editor or do I want to do something else first? At what point do you bring in an editor? Okay. The first stages that I would do is actually look at what we call a critique partner. So basically you would look at employing the skills of another writer by way of you look at their work and they look at your work. So it's a critique partnership works on a quid pro quo situation and you'll get feedback on story, writing style, things, a whole gambit of different things. And it will help you process. One of the really good sites, there's an online community site called scribophile.com. And there's another one called critiquecircle.com. They both work on the same principle where you have to critique other people's work before you're allowed to post your own work for critiquing. Critiquing other people's work is actually a good way of improving your own editorial skills because you will see things that you don't like. You will come about across a bit of writing that you just, it sits wrong with you. And you may not be able to explain why, but you see it. And so when somebody says something like the he said, she said problem, or they talk about too much backstory or appropriateness of backstory, you will see this in somebody else's writing and go, oh, is that what they mean? And then suddenly you know how to correct it and you can see it within your own writing. And, and that's what makes critique partners really good. In terms of when to bring in an editor, you're going to do that after you've had a good go yourself at editing your manuscript with the advice from other critique partners, other writers, and those sorts of people. You never want to send an editor a first draft ever because it will be a waste of money because they will focus. They'll get this piece of writing that has quite likely a large number of writing flaws that are easily corrected and those are the comments they're going to come back with so if you're going to send it to an editor you want to send something that is as polished as you can make it and then they will help you polish it that much further and take it to the next level okay so you mentioned critique partners is that an alternative to editing or does everybody need to hire an editor at some point point? and do you use right, an editor you for your own work if you are the type of writer that has absolutely no intention of ever publishing, then you will never need to hire an editor. So that's a good thing. Critique partnerships, depending on the critique partner that you get, can be an alternative to editing. You never want to rely on just one person. Same with an editor. You, if you hire an editor, you are still going to look at using things like critique partners and other people reading your stuff. You never want to rely on just the one opinion about a story. You want as a broad a spectrum as possible. In terms of my own writing, yes, I have a professional editor myself. I've hired um, a friend of mine who is a professional editor who's a journalist by background to do the critiquing of my full manuscript. Thankfully, my writing is at a level where she doesn't need to delve into the full language concept, but she does point out when I've used the wrong word here and there. And she's pointed those things out or, or she'll point out a sentence that just doesn't work for her. 
but in general, she, for her, what I've hired her for, she looks at the overall arc character and she helped me with my last manuscript to work out why it wasn't working. It was the ending. I just, I was struggling to get the ending right. And she helped me formulate how it had to go just to complete the story and complete the art. And now she's given it the thumbs up. So I'm, I'm excited because it means I can start that querying process and see if I can get an agent to pick it up. <laughs> All right. So you've mentioned an agent now. That doesn't sound like self-publishing. You mentioned self-publishing earlier. What's the differences, pros, cons? I'm not asking you to pick one as better or worse. <laughs> I know there's probably some books that are better self-published if you're writing for a really niche audience. At least that's what I've picked up by some Google searches. But what are the pros and cons of the two? And okay. what's your take on it? Yeah. All right. Basically, when we're talking about traditional publication, we're talking about going through and sending your manuscript and a query letter to an agent and then they will take over the possibility of finding a publishing house and the publisher will do the rest from that point. And that includes where they put in a cover design. They will do publishing houses on a traditional publication road will be in charge of the copy editing, which is the proofreading and you know, checking your spelling, grammar, all that sort of thing. They, they will take that and care of that lot. And they will take care of the main distribution side of things. If you're looking at a self-publication road, then you're it. You Everything is your responsibility. The advantage of self-publication is that 100% of the profits is yours. You don't have to share it with anyone. The only thing you have to worry about is the direct overhead costs. So there's no cut that you have to give to somebody else who's working, um, doing like the agent might take up to 15 to 20% in some cases. Um, and of course, an editor or the publisher house will take a, a large chunk on some cases as well. But if you're going self-publication, you also have to do all the marketing, all the distribution and everything associated with that. If you're going down the road of the traditional publishing, you get in theory, you will have somebody at the publishing house who is a marketing expert who will give you that little support angel on the shoulder going, now do this and now do that. And hopefully that they, they are there. Not all publishing houses have them, but quite a few of them do. If you're self-publishing, you don't get the same guidance, but there is a support network out there, an online network that will help you if you if you ask and say help there will be somebody out there that will tell you where to get the latest information on how to use things like amazon's create space how to use the different platforms for publication and those sorts of things and they do they are out there and all you have to do is say help me so there's some yeah there's pros and cons on both sides and it just matters on how much effort and energy you're willing to put in on either road. All right. So you mentioned the difference, some of the differences between traditional and self-pub. It sounds like you're going to go the traditional route now, but I'm going to touch on the self-pub for just a moment. Okay. Okay. So when you self-publish, you've basically, you're taking on the whole elephant for lack of a term. It's your job to design a cover or get one made. It's your job to write the book blurb, figure out when to market, where to market. That doesn't mean it have are there good books that are traditional published that are self published versus that weren't traditional published that could have been? Are there have you run on the converse side, have you run into traditional published books you're going, How did this ever get published? <laughs> Yes, yes, and yes. I have seen some brilliant, absolutely fantastic books that have been self-published. Um, there are, have been some self-published books that just had me on the floor laughing, and I could not stop, and I just had to keep reading them. But on the flip side, I have seen the odd traditional published books, and I'm just like, how? And 
and I would get only maybe a couple of chapters into them and just like, oh my God, this is just crap. Why am I reading this? So I will literally just put those aside. But you get that within any publishing. It's, it's a subjective field. Somebody thinks it's good, so they publish it. How successful a book really is will depend 100% on the marketing. There are some brilliant, brilliant books out there that have both been traditionally and self-published books that have bombed, they have failed. And it was all because of the lack of word of mouth that went out. It was the lack of marketing. You've also had books that they started as self-published books and they suddenly went viral and took over and they got a traditional publishing contract out of it and they've gone even better. Uh, Fifty Shades of Grey is one of those books. It started as a self-published book and it's now this viral beast that has taken over. Suki Stackhouse Diaries are the same and it was mainly because with the Suki Stackhouse Diaries, it's mainly because of the television show that it just took over and everybody wanted to read those books and that's how they got the Charlene Harris, that's how she got the publication contract. All right, so you've you've read both good and bad books that were both self-published and traditional published, and you've seen, you know, Fifty Shades of Grey went from self-pub to traditional pub. Does that mean that if I self-publish my book, it'll be traditionally published? No, not necessarily. It depends 100% on how something, how successful something becomes. And that's where Fifty Shades of Grey was a, a bit of an anomaly, really. It became a successful beast and somebody decided to take it over from there because the traditional publishing house will only take on things that they can see getting money for. How are they going to get the money? There are businesses and any other business is going to be the same. They, they want to make sure that they can make a profit out of that book. So going down that road of traditional publication is a big risk, but so is self-publication. So they all have their pros and cons. All right. So now I think we've covered almost everything we set out to cover. Is there anything else you'd like to talk about that I missed? I tried to cover everything we'd previously talked about. I would be racking my brain and I would not actually, no, no doubt I'll probably think of something once we finish, but okay. isn't that the way? Usually <laughs> is. All right. Well, I thank you for being my guest and I will, I've got to tell you, we do share a philosophy in common from what I gather with your uh, critiques. You do like to end them on a good note. So I always like to end my podcasts on a good note. Why don't you give your web address for your publishing company one more time for my editorial company it's blackwolfeditorial.com all one word and that's probably pretty much the only number that you need well thank you very much for being my guest it's been awesome talking to you and now let's get to that good news story all right i decided for our good news episode i was going to Make Judy hang on with me and talk about her love of space and stars and the cars on Mars, otherwise known as the Mars Rover. Judy, I'll let you explain what NASA's been up to with the Mars Rovers and other random space things. Take it away. Thank you. I'm not sure if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but we'll give it a go. Um, Most people are aware that NASA is working really hard to actually put a manned mission on Mars. And part of that is the robotic missions that they've got. Most people are aware that we've sent rovers and there have been a couple of wonderful calculations that have gone a bit cuckoo with some of the rovers along the way. What some people don't quite realize is that the rovers are still operational, or at least curiosity is, and it's still bringing, sending back data. Um, If you actually take a look at some of the websites that they've got, the NASA websites in particular, there are selfies from Curiosity, which is one of the rovers that's up there. 
And it's so cool to see these selfie images of the rovers. One of the things that probably hasn't hit public news too much, especially with the elections that are going on in the States at the moment, is that there was actually a mission launched in March to send a, a, an orbiter and another rover type engine to Mars. And it's due to arrive in orbit around Mars in October of this year. On that mission is some additional relay uh, um, radios, which will hopefully boost the signals that we're getting from the current rovers that are already on the planet. And we might get some more data, more information. One of the things, reasons why we're really interested in Mars is that there is running water on Mars. Most people don't actually know that. Wait and a minute. I find that quite you said they found running water on Mars. Are they going to find yes. little green men next? We might. We might. Um, the thing is, is the reason why water, running water, is incredibly important and is such a fantastic discovery is that you actually need liquid water to support life as we know it. Mars, we've known for some time, has actually got ice caps. So we've got in the northern and southern poles of Mars, you have these ice crusts that are just there, but they've actually found seasonal running water that we can actually see from orbital images and monitor them. And you can see the running water flow as it's going down through the, the braided rivers. And that's just exciting because that means there is the potential for life on Mars. Whether we will find little green men, I don't know. It'd be so awesome if we did. It really would be pretty cool. But at, on the point of view of colonization, it means that's one less thing we have to worry about. So that's pretty cool. There's a couple of other things that they're doing. And exactly how far we're going to get with the technology, I don't know. There was supposed to be another mission that they were going to launch um, a bit later this year. But unfortunately, back in December, they had a, a leak within one of the vacuum systems. The, one of the vacuum tubes wasn't sealing properly, and hence they had to postpone that mission. And because of the way the windows and the way the planets orbit the sun, the next opportunity, launch opportunity for that particular mission is 2018. So that's a bit of a, a downside, but hopefully that particular mission will go forward. And that particular mission was to look at drilling down into the crust of Mars so they can get a bit more of an interior structure and understand more of what's actually going on inside their Mars core, which is pretty cool as well. So. I have to say, this is not the first time Judy has talked to me about space and NASA and stars and Mars and things like that. But until I talked to her, I wasn't really excited about it because I never understood it. She always makes it so understandable. <laughs> well, I'm glad I do. <laughs> I, I suppose it's just one of those things. Yep, you've got a knack for making explaining the complicated stuff in a real simple way. Good. <laughs> uh, thank you for providing our good our good news segment as well, or at least part of our good news segment as well as your wonderful lesson on how to edit edit your work. I thought that was fascinating as well. Thank you, and this time it really is goodbye. <laughs> yeah. <Hey>, uh... <laughs> In honor of Judy being from New Zealand, I found another interesting news story, which is also somewhat sciencey, about a mother who invented a special watch for her son who has a medical condition. He hated wearing those metal or bracelets because everybody knew what they were and everybody was asking, what's wrong with you? Well, mom said, I'm going to invent something better. So Trace, Tracy Austin came up, had two compelling reasons for inventing a watch, a watch that reveals personal, vital personal data and health details when scanned with the cell phone. It's got one of those QR codes. We're also used to scanning them these days. Makes perfect sense to me. Her two sons, Joel 12 and Levi 14, have mild hemophilia. 
and they hated wearing their metal alerts. So, so she decided to come up with something better. I'm going to let you listen to them explaining it in their own words. Most people get cut, they bleed for about five minutes. I bleed about two or three times longer. I used to have a medical alert and it was like annoying because it was like big metal and clunky and now I have a cool watch and like now you can just scan it and because people used to ask me what's wrong with me which was really annoying now they can just now they just ask where do you get one from yeah it's like a normal watch it has all like stopwatch and stuff but um there's a slider and you slide that down it has a QR code and you scan the QR code it doesn't have anything like where you live because that's just creepy but um it has like your name, some numbers, a um, photo of you, your blood type, what you're allergic to. Well, as a mum of two young boys that have a, a bleeding condition, it's great for me because it gives me peace of mind. I can put my mark on them and, that, and I give them a bit of freedom. They can go off and do things that perhaps I wouldn't have uh, been so comfortable with beforehand. Um, and I just know that if something does go wrong or if they got lost or anything happened to them or any other child for that matter, uh, the parents can be contacted straight away. So it just, it takes that fear out of letting your children go out and explore. I thought that was really cool. Hope you did too. Now, Christchurch also said that el- for elderly folk who aren't accustomed to scanning... The article also said for people who aren't accustomed to scanning such as older people there is a number you can send a text message to so even if you don't have the latest smartphone you can actually help use this watch to find out who this person is their medical condition and how to contact a loved one which i think that's pretty cool and it's probably faster than calling 1-800 metal alert just to find the information and if you don't have your Subscription paid up, they won't give it to you. I don't know if this has a subscription service. It didn't mention it. But there's already been... People have already said they want it. And I think it's a pretty cool, pretty cool thing. Now, somebody brought up in the comments... You know, how do medical people know... And somebody said, well, basically, the emergency room doctors, nurses, and paramedics would be trained. And it's got a, sy- a symbol for medical. And somebody who's on an ambulance said that med- ambulance staff know to look for them. So I think, I think it definitely could be the wave of the future in medical alert technology. It's definitely fascinating. All right, I have one more story. Yeah, I'm going to try and squeeze in one more. One more story. All right. Military story. They don't always get everything right. They try, but they don't. Over in Germany. A U.S. Army airborne exercise in Germany has attracted more than a million viewers on social media. After a video surfaced showing a Humvee breaking free of its rigging and plummeting to the ground, followed by another and another. Friday afternoon, the video posted on Facebook. The Facebook group, U.S. Army WTF Moments. It had 1.5 million views. Yes, 1.5 million views. The scene starts serenely as the equipment is dropped by parachute April 11th from planes flying with the 173rd Airborne Brigade, flying across the blue skies until the first Humvee breaks free and drops. It's followed by a second and third. And increasing laughter on the video. The Army said no one was hurt and is investigating what went wrong and who shot the video. Sounds like the Army, doesn't it? I know it sounds like the Army I know and love. They not only want to know what went wrong, they want to know who let the cat out of the bag. 
I think it's funny. Everybody makes mistakes. We're all humans. But found an awesome good news story. You ever dreamed of throwing a message in a bottle and seeing where it washed up? Well, the world record-breaking bottle was discovered by Marianne Winkler during a vacation at the German Amram Island, April 15, 2015. When Winkler found it, she could see inside a message inside it saying, Break the glass. She and her husband did the best to avoid breaking the bottle while retrieving the contents. Ultimately, they had to break the bottle to uncover the documents. It's always a joy when someone finds a message in a bottle, Winkler, a retired German post worker, told Amram News. Where does it come from? Who wrote it? And how long has it been traveling on the winds, waves, and currents? The Winklers found a postcard written in English, German, and Dutch that asked the recipient to return the bottle to the Marine Biological Association in Plymouth, Devon. If the bottle finders returned the message, the message writer promised that a shilling would be awarded to them. And there's a really cool picture of the postcard. All right. The association was startled when it received the bottle and its contents and immediately performed some research to discover its story. Turns out this bottle was was one out of 1,020 that were released into the North Sea by George Parker Bider, former president of the association. He put this bottle in the ocean sometime between 1904 and 1906. Bider died at age 91 in 1954. He was using the bottles in an experiment to prove that deep that the deep sea current in the North Sea flowed from east to west. All right, many of the bottles were found by fishermen trawling with deep sea nets, others washed up on shore, some were never recovered. Most of the bottles were found within a relatively short time. We're talking months, not decades. The bottle Winkler discovered spent 108 years and 138 days at sea after Bider sent it to float. According to the Guinness, and that's according to Guinness World Records. The previous record had been held by a bottle found in Shetland, and it was at sea for 99 years and 43 days. Although the promised reward of a shilling is outdated, as shillings have not been used in Britain for more than 20 years, the association still wanted to honor Winkler's reward. We found an old, they found an old shilling. They think they might have gotten it off eBay. And they sent it to her with a letter saying thank you. If that isn't a cute story, I don't know what is. End the day. Remember, end the day on a good note. I'm out of here. K98 Talk is continuing to expand its lineup. This means we are expanding our advertising base. Whether you're a startup trying to push through to the next level or an established business trying to supplement your advertising budget, web-based advertising is a solid investment. Thanks to Talk's newest partnership with TuneIn Radio and instant access to our sister station, K98FM, we give you worldwide access at a reasonable cost. Interested parties should email us at advertise at k98talk.org. Before you smoke, think about this. When you smoke, it affects more than just your health. I love to dance. That's something that I handed down to my family. Um, I was pretty good at it, too, before my doctor told me that secondhand smoke at work caused me to have asthma attacks, infections, and lung damage. And I never smoked. I can't work there anymore. Think about the ones around you. This has been a public service announcement from K98 Talk. If you want to work until you keel over, have less of everything in retirement, or give back more of your hard-earned money to the stock market again, then just ignore me. But if you'd like to protect the money you save, receive a steady, predictable retirement income, and enjoy financial security for as long as you live, then listen to this. You can download a free report that reveals the wealth-building secrets Wall Street and the banks don't want you to know. You'll learn how you can get guaranteed growth, safety, 
and real prosperity without risking your money in the Wall Street casino. And how to get the money you need when you need it, simply by asking for it. This is the best way to have a 100% secure retirement and know your money will last as long as you do. To learn more about this method and to get your free report, go to 29security.com. That's the number 29security.com. 29security.com. Go to 29security.com. You're listening to the Spark Radio Network.